So first, a couple of unit tests. Um, we need to make sure that everything's working. Yeah, laser beam. We have cards, slides, and integration test. Otherwise, this will be a, a failure. So thank you very much uh, for having me here. I'm really pleased uh, to actually be part of this. And with so many people, um, they turned the lights on very bright so I don't actually have to be seeing all of these people and get really nervous that I'm speaking to hundreds of people and live streaming. So thank you, organizers, for that. Uh, when we do the quiz part of this, uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to improvise because I can't actually see anyone. So I'm here to talk today about uh, quality transformation. I work currently in Berlin for a company called HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the leading supplier of meal kits. For those of you who are, don't know what meal kits are, we put together fresh products and deliver them to your doorstep. We deliver them to your doorstep uh, once a week in a box. So you get two or three or four meal kits with the ingredients and a recipe so that you can prepare a gourmet-like meal or a, a standard meal uh, in the comfort of your own kitchen. We are the world's leading provider of that. We're in uh, 12 countries at the moment. And this year, we are on track uh, to deliver 260 million boxes. So I want to put that in context uh, just to, to so you realize the scale that we're working at and that I'm not uh, just going to talk to you about a quality transformation from a unicorn to an ostrich. Uh, we're talking about something at, at scale here. So who am I and why do you actually want to listen to me? The second question I can't answer. I can only hope that you will. Who I am is I am the chief of staff to the CTO at HelloFresh. What does that mean? It means nothing. It means nothing and it means everything. Basically, it allows me to act as the transformation lead inside HelloFresh. The HelloFresh technical group is uh, 350, approximately 350 people, and we're hiring. Okay. 350 people. And why do you think a company with only eight years in the, uh, in the industry needs a transformation? Well, we made some of the same mistakes that many startups make. We incurred large amounts of technical debt and risk in our code, and we continue in some ways to, uh, I don't want to say make the same mistakes, but make the same mistakes that everybody else makes. Uh, incurring high, high risk, technical debt, uh, problems making business, what we think are the proper business decisions without considering the cost that's going to come later. I compare technical debt inside our code to making a purchase. If you make a purchase of a house, if you're lucky and you live in a, a place with low interest rates, you can get a oh, 2% uh, or 2.1% interest rate on your house and pay it off over 20 or 25 years. If you go out and you buy something, however, um, uh, with a credit card, you are going to incur debt of 18 or 21 or even 25%. So the debt on your house is a bit like this technical debt that sits in your code and lasts there a long time. The credit card is a little bit like making a decision, I'm going to do a POC, but I'm not going to pay any attention to the technical debt or risk that's going to be incurred. That's like a credit card. And then ignoring that over time and building things on top of it is like using your MasterCard to pay off your visa. You want to avoid that at all costs. So I am, as you can probably hear from that and from my job, I am a businessman. I am concerned about uh, costs and profit. I'm concerned about efficiency, etc. But full disclosure, I didn't actually train as a business person or a technical person. I actually trained as a historian and studying uh, 18th century African slavery uh, in the United States uh, left me eminently qualified to stand here and talk to you about quality. Um, so I'm a businessman. I'm also a historian. And like all the historians or history teachers that you know, there will be a quiz. 
there will be a quiz, and I will at times appear to be lecturing you. The reason for that is because I am lecturing you. It's in my bones, I can't get rid of it, so just deal with it. The third thing is, unfortunately, I am also a complete geek. I love getting down deep into code, I love getting understanding microservices, uh, talk to me about uh, Kubernetes with an Istio uh, service mesh overlay and talk YAML files with me. Boy, that's it. I, I'm good to go all the way till five o'clock today. So I, in order to help you, will provide you with a couple of helps. So when I am in uh, my history teacher mode, you will see this little gentleman here. When I move into other modes, you'll see other little icons, so you'll know how to react as I'm talking. So, I would like to talk to you about some of the challenges that I see every day, and I think you will have uh, already seen them. Uh, we have, in software development, a question, a, a lack of a working definition of what quality means. Put 10 people in a room together and ask them what quality means and you'll come up with 15 or 20 different answers, none of which uh, um, overlap. There's a lack of quality measurements. We don't measure our quality. If we don't know what it is, it's very difficult to measure it. We also have a lack of understanding by project management that quality is on target. When's the last time somebody in project, uh, a product owner or project manager uh, said to you, listen, We've got to improve our quality. I'm willing to give up a couple of features in order to get our quality up to speed. That happens all the time, right? Oh, a project manager probably just said that, right? <laughs> so, uh, inadequate use of reviews and inspections. Oftentimes, we do code reviews at the end of a, 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 of a right before we want to merge it. And the code review will come through and it'll have 4,000 lines of code, and it'll have touched 53 different files. I'm not making that up. That pulled, I pulled that up from last week's, one of the commits pull requests from last week. Uh, we don't do code reviews or uh, inspections very well. We have inadequate defect prevention. We have defect, uh, defect detection, which we do in these so-called end-to-end tests, but we don't have adequate defect prevention. We have insufficient or careless testing, uh, not blaming testers for that, but the entire SDLC. Uh, excessive scheduling pressure leading to unwise attempts to short, uh, shortcut quality control. Listen, if you can just get this feature in in the next five days, we can increase our revenues by 3% on the quarter. Uh, yeah, that's right, it's gonna uh, add lots of technical debt and lots of risk, but don't worry about it. Uh, uh, we need it. And unstable and ambiguous user requirements. We see these often. Now, my question to you is, and this is the quiz part, has anybody in this audience not seen at least two of those? Three. Four. Okay, you get the point. Here's my, my question. When do you think these were written? Somebody else wrote these, not me. Anybody want to venture a guess? This is the part where I have to ad lib here. When? 76. 76, no. Good guess, though. No. In fact, these problems were originally written by, and this is the history, you'll see again, historian. These were originally written by a man named Capers Jones in 1993. Now, my question to you is, if he was aware of this in the software development world of 1993, or I suspect somebody actually knew about this in 1976 as well, why don't we pay any attention to this? I call this historical attention span deficit disorder. Yeah, I know, I just made that up. In fact, what it is, is we're not actually learning from history. We're not learning from the mistakes we're making all the time. We continually, and this is, this is probably something you've seen on a regular basis, 
we continually say, yeah, but the business case is we have to get it out the door as fast as possible. And then you build a POC. And you know, you said at the beginning, I'm going to take that POC and I'm going to fix it after we prove it's successful. And then you always go back and fix it. <coughs> In fact, I would guess 90% of POCs end up as production. They should call it production instead of, instead of POCs. These are mistakes that we make over and over again because we're not paying enough attention at the beginning to uh, quality. We're ins trying to insert it afterwards. So, where does quality actually begin? If you can't insert it at the end, where does it actually begin? Okay, I'm going to lecture again. Classically, the idea was we could build something, test it completely, make sure it worked absolutely under all circumstances in all cases. That was one way to deliver something. The delivery time was pretty slow on this, but you got a good quality product. Does anybody recognize what that is? That is the Apollo guidance computer. That was a computer that was developed to guide the Apollo moon missions to the moon, land, and then come back again and bring home astronauts safely. This was developed in the 1960s by MIT <coughs> with some others, and it took the technology that normally took up most of a room and compressed it down to something that was a little bit bigger than a notebook, uh, considerably heavier, had 4,000 words of memory, uh, didn't do much, and had an added user interface bonus that it could be used by somebody with big, thick gloves. It is a, it is a marveling, an engineering marvel. However, it took a long time to develop. It took almost six years to get it to work after uh, design, testing, building, rebuilding, rebuilding, retesting, rebuilding. It was difficult. The other option that, that people think we have is we'll go agile. And most people don't really understand what agile means. They say, ah, oh, yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do a POC. And then, you know what, we'll go back and fix it later. And that doesn't always work. So we have to find the right balance between the two. Where do we insert quality? We have to think enough about it at the beginning of our development cycle in order to uh, deliver a decent uh, product that can be extended and extensible and tested and, and built on later. But we don't want to do it so slowly that we end up building an Apollo guidance computer and it takes years and years to get, to get it done. So it should seem obvious but we'll st I'll state it anyway, quality has to be managed from the start and evaluated and re-evaluated as your, your product or your project uh, advances. So here we are, um, businessman. I think it's important to measure performance, to measure the performance and quality of all of your software. This, these here are uh, numbers that are taken from the book Accelerate, which you haven't read. Uh, if you haven't read, you should. It, I would recommend it to all uh, developers, uh, QA, product, and management. And basically, what it says is if you measure these four items, delivery frequency, lead time to change, mean time to recovery, or in the case of mobile applications or embedded applications, mean time to reship, uh, and your change failure rate simply means, what they did was they simply checked and found out what high-performing companies generally did. So the, the Googles, the Amazons, uh, the Facebooks of the world, what, what they were used to, what scale. And then they also uh, categorized what low performers were, were doing. So just by a show of hands, how many people and their companies deliver products with uh, 
uh, delivery frequency of multiple times per day, lead time to change. That's how long does it take to get a feature into production of less than one hour? Uh, how long does it take to recover from a, an, an outage, uh, mean time to recovery or reship? And uh, change failure rate of less than 15%. Just a quick show of hands. How many companies actually can do that? I see one, two, three, four, okay, under 10. Okay, now we all can't be Googles and Amazons of the world. Um, there's a couple of, of marks between that, but how many people work for companies or deliver products that fall in that range? Yeah, more than 10, okay. Okay, so probably somewhere in the middle uh, of that is where most of us must lead. I will tell you that to move your way from the right-hand side of the screen to the left-hand side of the screen is very difficult. It's not a linear move. It is a, a, a geometric or even an exponential move. It is very, very difficult to make those incremental steps down to lead time to change of, 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 of an hour and mean time to recovery of an hour. Now, one of the things that the Accelerate book uh, suggested was that there is room for up to 100% improvement. In fact, the book states in some cases up to 200% improvement. Now, if you could go to your managers and say, I have a way where we could improve everything up there by 100%, so we could double our speed, cut in half our lead time to change, cut in half our change failure rate, et cetera. Change failure rate, by the way, is how often do you deliver crap into production? This happens. Um, it's unfortunate, but it is true. So if you had the opportunity to, do, to cut that in half, would you think that business leaders would react to it, that they would accept it, that they would like this? You would think so. I would think so. The problem comes, however, is one, they don't necessarily believe it, and two, it's very difficult to actually do this without measuring it. So measurement is extremely important in this case. The other point I would uh, uh, stress, again, in my business mode, and don't worry, we'll get to the geeky stuff in a minute, is that we spend a lot of time doing unplanned rework, manual testing, manual deployments, working on outages, and handling bugs. Now, I, I, I want to just uh, take an aside here for just a moment. I have this argument on a regular basis where people tell me, uh, they've read in a book, bugs are inevitable. Bugs are going to happen no matter what you do. And my question to them and to you is, why? Is that true? How do you know it's true? I don't actually believe that bugs are inevitable. I may be one of the only people in the world who actually will publicly <laughs> state this, but I do not believe that bugs are inevitable. I do not believe we actually have to have bugs. Yes, mistakes will be made. I understand this because whenever humans are involved in anything, mistakes get made. This is one of the reasons that manual testing, which could be replaced by automated testing, is a problem. Manual testing that's exploratory, uh, that's fine. That requires uh, a certain human cognition, that's fine. But what I'm talking about is mistakes. Mistakes do get made, but we can reduce the impact of these mistakes and we can limit the impact of, of, of bugs getting to production if we catch them early. So, one of the other things that the Accelerate book found is that up to 70% of our development time is spent on activities not related to new work. That's really harsh. In fact, this particular four horsemen of the SDLC apocalypse, they are the resources you have to take on Additionally, because people don't believe you can get it done with a minimum number of people, so your original resources, your cost of delay, your cost of excess rework, and your lost opportunity costs. Now, just very quickly, those are um, the lost opportunity costs. I at HelloFresh, if I deliver a box, if I deliver a box that has an error in it or a mistake, it is very unlikely that an opportunity cost that you will then recommend it to your friends. If I deliver you a meal that you didn't order, if you're a vegetarian, I deliver you a piece of steak, you are very unlikely to, to, to suggest that to your friends. So there's a lost opportunity cost. Cost of excess rework, doing work a second or a third time that you didn't need to do uh, 
uh, or they didn't do right the first time. Delayed, cost of delay. If you have developers working and fixing bugs, they are not working on new features. So these are all important. Then the final one is because you're going so slowly, you've got so many bugs, you've got so many problems, you've got 10 people in this, the boss says, in order to get things done better, I'm going to give you more people. And then you have Conway's Law, and nine women are trying to make a baby in a month. So I'm going to, uh, uh, in the interest uh, of time here, suggest to you that there are uh, five ways to, to, to move forward on this. Uh, you can choose your own. They're not in any particular order, but I'm going to run through those, uh, those five things that I think are important to improving um, uh, quality, and this is part of a transformation. Now, just like developers are supposed to be refactoring their work all the time, continuously, it's part of their regular work. They don't take one day out of the week to re refactor. They shouldn't have a refactoring team, etc. cetera. Uh, at the same time, the transformation of quality has to happen on a regular basis. We have to be constantly reassessing how we're testing, how we're working, how we're analyzing and reporting and monitoring data. So I'm going to get through these. Now, I think you've all seen something like this. This is a pretty classic system. This is a, 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 a microlith, a, a macro service, a monolith, whatever. You have your clients, your REST APIs, your services in your database. No, nothing unusual there. Pretty straightforward. We've got testing down. We understand how that works. That's, that's not a, a big thing. You can call it macroservice. You call it microlist. Call it whatever you want. We're pretty good. We run a swagger. Everybody's seen this. Everybody's comfortable with it. Um, that's what a microservice architecture looks like. That is a little bit different. This does not go well with this. One of the problems you have, of course, is that as soon as you hit that API gateway with your mobile application, which is following a basic REST API testing strategy, you get into the back end here and all hell breaks loose. Because what happens is you've got, in fact, maybe an event-based pub-sub system, so a publish and subscribe system. You've got uh, a messaging system that's like Kafka running. You've got events all over the place and you have no idea where to put your tests. Your tests don't work all the time. You're wondering why. The tests need to go in places like this. They need to go between the distributed data sources, the messaging system, and then back to the systems again. It's not easy to put a REST-based uh, uh, system into this. It's very difficult, in fact. And it is impossible to manual test that. So. Yeah, okay. This is, this is um, a value stream map. You've normally seen probably value stream maps look like that. And in fact, all I did was turn it into a circle. The point of this is, is very simple, that a software development lifecycle is not this piece over here, development and testing. Uh, a lot of you probably use JIRA. How many people here have an in-progress tag and then right after it, a QA tag. Yeah. So it's like a throw it over the wall. Yeah. Oh, I've just developed it. Here, tester, please test for me. We've seen this. We know that that doesn't work, yet we still do it. I would draw your attention only to this here, that the product owner has to be an intricate part, an integral part, sorry, of the entire software development lifecycle. So, When we're measuring and when we're looking at software development, we need to know how long something actually takes to get in to production. When we calculate, when we do our estimations at the beginning and somebody says, oh, I can develop that feature and it'll only take me four sprints, six sprints, whatever. In fact, they're lying because it doesn't take just that. It takes all the time here. It takes the gaps that are there. It takes the deployment time. The, uh, the, the Phoenix review, when something goes wrong and you have to figure it out, the ops time, and then, of course, the time for excess rework to fix what you broke the first time. Those are all things that have to be calculated into the estimation. So this is uh, telemetry. Telemetry is the kind of testing that needs to be done in a microservice environment and architecture. Now, you can see 
I've got my geek hat on. So this is a, a contrived Kubernetes system with a service mesh overlay, and I haven't done anything spectacular in it except I've run through a couple of uh, requests. And to show you what happens at these requests, it just goes off into three. I simply set those to do a 60, 30, 10 percent split, and that's all it was. Let me just go back here. <clears throat> in testing with a microservice architecture, it's very important that testers and QA people begin to understand that there are different tools that need to be used. You, you still have to rely on the, the, the uh, REST API tests at the front end, etc. but you're also going to have to start looking at how uh, other tools that manage those event-based publish and subscribe systems uh, work. Getting your information directly from the logs is actually very, very important in this case. So your analysis is going to have to change. In addition, we have to search for risk in our code much, much earlier. Now, I, I won't go into to, to this other than to say the, the code complexity is not necessarily the most important thing you're looking for if you're doing a code analysis. Code complexity, cyclometric complexity, shows us how complicated the code is, how many things it tries to do at the same time. The number of changes that are taking place, the, the, the uh, change frequency of a file, is also important because it gives you more opportunities to make mistakes and introduce problems. When you combine those two, making many changes on high-risk code or high-complexity code, you, you have a serious hotspot. The, this is a code base I grabbed from, uh, I think, from Istio. And the size, of the, the size of the circle represents the uh, uh, complexity, and the uh, color represents the uh, change frequency. So here, by doing this, very early in the process, we can analyze our code on a regular basis and spot trends, find out which pieces of code are actually getting um, uh, uh, raising risk and introducing problems. The reason we do this is that we know that many, many bugs come from code that has high complexity that's being changed often. Now, if we know that, and we can go backwards and try to eliminate that risk, then we probably will reduce the number of bugs we introduce into the system. This is part of, uh, of analysis, the new analysis that has to take place in uh, the next generation of quality. We should also be reporting and dashboarding everything so that we can see, we can watch trends, we can see what's happening, we can set goals, and we can watch it. I pulled this from uh, code, th this and the previous one from Code Scene uh, by Empire, which is a, a code analysis tool, behavioral uh, code analysis, which simply means uh, snapshots of the complexity and problems of code looked at over time. We also can track code quality, find problems before they actually enter into production while they're still at the code level. Uh, I could talk about this more afterwards in the Q&A session if anybody's interested. So back to this, this hypothetical um, situation or this hypothetical uh, contrived um, environment. What I've done here is I've imagined a, a canary deploy where I deploy a certain percentage to Web3, and I introduce some errors over here. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I introduce a, uh, a canary deployment. So I do a 60-30-10 split, and I can look at it in real time. I'm watching it using uh, Kiali in this case. So this is a tool, for example, that you would want to be looking at as you're doing deployments into staging, if you use staging, and this is important for um, uh, microservice testing and architectures. So I have the same thing now, but in this particular one, I've introduced a, an additional problem. What I've said is introduce a, a delay into it by introducing a fault. So I've injected a fault by saying I want to take 
and introduce uh, a two-second delay into 25% of the calls and see what happens. The reason for that is microservices don't always behave in the same way that you're used to those macro services in the back end. They have to contend with problems of the network, problems of, of disappearing services, etc. It's not a problem when you have 10 microservices. It's a problem when you have 100. It's a problem when you have 500, 1,000, 10,000, forget it. You're never going to get anywhere without uh, some sort of automated and uh, visual view. So in this, I've simply injected a fault to see what happens. So in a staging system or even in a production system, I have a fault injection. And then here, what I've done is something that's absolutely critical for uh, microservice testing, it's distributed tracing. Now there's Open Census and uh, Jaeger. These are both uh, tools that can be used. And basically what happens is you introduce a tracing ID into every call and then you can watch it going through the system and you can find areas that it's slower or faster and see as, it's, as your request is moving through the microservices, getting to the certain data sources and then coming back where your errors are. This is one of the only ways you can actually and effectively manage uh, testing of microservices in the architecture I showed earlier. So I want over the next <coughs> cup, the next two days for you to be thinking about a couple of things. I want you to think that quality is not just about getting the code right. There's always a business logic behind it. There's all, uh, with, with most companies, even with uh, NGOs or uh, charities, there are business requirements behind it. You need to satisfy the business and ultimately the business is the end user. So I want you to be thinking about that. I want you to be thinking about how the speakers are going to talk to you about managing risk. The innovative methodologies and proposals they're going to make for you, uh, make to you about how to manage risk, to insert quality early in the process, to make intelligent decisions about what to do and when, either the Apollo guidance computer or the Tower of Pisa, your choice. Find the right balance in that, challenge them to see, uh, to, to give you that information. How is this going to help me reduce risk? How is this going to help me improve my business uh, um, uh, requirements? And this here is simply a word cloud of all of the people and titles of all of the contracts or all of the talks that are going to be given over the next two days. I threw it together. And as you can see, testing actually came out the highest. So understand that when people are talking to you over the next couple of days about testing, challenge them, ask them, what does this mean for, my, for our business? What does this mean for quality? What does this mean for uh, avoiding the uh, Tower of Pisa or AGS trap? So thank you very much for your time and I hope you enjoy the next two days.